Well, so the the main thing we wanted to do is we had the, the pentagram in the first movie, which was the kind of thing identifying on the box itself. We wanted to take that to a different level in this and still have an homage to it. So I did like a rough sketch of, of just this, it was really this function of this tearing of the face and we see this, this pentagram. And then the, the guys at Russell Effects created this, uh, took took that rough sketch, which I, there are they still here? Did they, did they bail out? Right. Damien, you still here? Yeah, you guys did. Yeah. 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 Wanting to tear it off and have that homage to the first film. And almost have it be a benevolent design. Not so much that this guy's just here to do a job, right? He's like, I'm just here, man, to do my thing. And I've got nothing that I can do with people. Just here to do a thing and then I'm going to take it off. Yes, as far as the storyline goes, I know Fred, in the beginning, he was expressing some type of frustration. Was he also having that version at that moment, or was, what was going on? Why he was so frustrated by enjoying the basketball role? So this is for Britt, uh, Britt's character, and the question was, you know, why was why was the officer so frustrated at the beginning of the film? Was he having issues with the uh, mold as well, or was this something else? What was really going on? Well, I chose my preparation that I was. I'm curious what you think. But 
I, I chose that I would see things. So when I came up on her, I was kind of checking her out and sniffing her out, you know, to see if she was part of my imagination. <laughs> I think I'll be around that scene. <laughs> yeah. that, that, and that, that scene is almost one of those direct lifts from my ship where that character is doing something similar. It's a similar scene, but it was written. That, that's what it's, you know, he's, he doesn't trust that this is a real person he's looking at. But he's like, I don't, I don't believe this could be a human, it could be something else because he's seen things. But he's because he's this rough guy. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to give those secrets away to help her out, right? And she's like, I, I, have, "Were you seeing things?" And you're like, "No, it's just a mole, man. It's nothing else." Yeah, I just wanted to get out of there. And if you notice, you know, I'm much better looking now than I was then, it's because you know, we had makeup do like a little drinker things. So I was Kobe. Kobe, but that scene. Me in that scene? <laughs> you, you, you may have recall in last shift that there was a big piece of skull missing. That's what he's probably looking for, right? The skull missing was right on uh, Officer Price. Price first, here, yeah. But that is kind of some of that. That was a direct connection to the first one where he's like, turn around. Because yeah. he's, he's making sure she doesn't have any wounds on her. Missing pieces. Missing right. pieces. Someone in the bed there over there. What made you want to make a horror movie from the point of view of law enforcement? The question is, what, why did Anthony want to make a horror film from the perspective of law enforcement? You know, the extension of it, for this movie, it was just an extension of what we decided to keep from the original film. Or we decided, let's keep it a police, police officer in this decommission station. Uh, for the first film, it, it all started, I had worked with that sound team several times. We made a few movies together, and I knew the sound team was, was capable of doing a lot. And I wanted to design a, a movie around the sound and the, the capabilities of what we could do with, with the sound. So it started this idea of a dispatch office, because it could be a, a one person with electronics. There was a, a way to do a lot in that dispatch office. We found it, uh, a decommissioned police station while we were writing the script for the first film, Flash Ship. And, and that's what we kind of really landed on, making her uh, one of the written movies, obviously. And then just carrying that over to this film. And this film, you know, the state of law enforcement is different now. Right? The view of it from America is skewed a bit. So we, we wanted to bring tones of that in to this film, bring it in, and not, because you know, the, the lead actress, Jess, she didn't want to hammer those things. She wanted, it, for us, it was always about what's going to affect the character at the moment, how she's treated by the police, or how her father talks to her, and, and how are they going to manipulate her in a situation. So that's really the lens it, it was brought in for with this movie. I have a question for uh, Sam Brooks, and I was wondering why you thought Price didn't want her the shotgun. Well, I think this is totally off script in DCMS, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm just fucking with it. <laughs> I think that's my, my, my whole spiel. You know, it was, wasn't possessed. Well, you saw that it had ghost shells. Yes. Or so you never know what she could have done with that. You're telling me she's just going to pick up a shotgun that's a year old and have eight shells in it. Yeah. Well, who here thinks the shotgun was ever even real? Ooh, ooh. Now, I don't know if you don't, like, I don't know if you people pick up on it, but at the end of the movie, when she's lying in the hallway, she reaches for the shotgun and she picks up her hand. And that's just, and it's some of the, so one of the producers was like, hey, you know you have this shot in there that there's, there's a mask in it. Is, that must be a mistake. I'm like, no, I'm doing it on purpose. Because if a ghost stands you a shotgun, Ever really exist. Who, who would leave a shotgun behind? Would the police leave a shotgun yeah, behind? Yeah, like a tree falls in the woods and no one's around here. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make a noise. So to me, you know, the shotgun was not really the thing, thing. In, the, in the movie. It made, it made me want to remember after we were doing the first screening, I said, hey, do you want to check that edit there? Yeah, I was, I was, 
<laughs> you were one of them that said that too. He's like, uh, you don't need to send me notes, CMS. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, sir. Uh, writing this, the content is really, really heavy. How do you stay mentally healthy if you're writing this thing? Well, well, right. So the question was, it's very heavy material. How do you stay mentally healthy? And that's for you. I, I don't know that I was ever meant to be healthy. <laughs> You do. I mean, you know, I think when you're writing horror, and I write lots of other things and take me out of that zone, but I like, I will say, like, my, my wife, who's in the movie, Natalie Victoria, uh, she doesn't like it when I write horror because I, in general, I become a darker person for, for several months, you know. And so when you're in that world for a long time, I think you can, you can get into a dark state of mind because you're always looking for that. But on set, you know, while we're shooting it, we have, I like to keep a fun set. And I, like, we always laugh between takes and, and Jess is very good. Like, we're always doing comedy in between the horrors to, to alleviate that. And, and like, you know, I accept on days where she had to go to really dark places, but, but that's, I think you gotta get into it when you're in that mindset. Just let go. Sir, uh, what are your plans in the world of Malamo? Are you mostly trying to get like these different ideas? Like, are you trying to build upon this world, or are you trying to get like, different? So this is question for Anthony and for those in the back. So, what are your plans with Malam? Are you building on this world? Are you working on something else? What's going on? I, I think you directed at the audience. Yeah. What do you guys, what do you guys think? Okay. <laughs> wanted to have this be a launching place to take it in other directions, to follow. And I think that's why we call it Mammal, because we want it to be about the fly more so than this station on this night. So there's a bigger there's a bigger picture coming at the end of this film that we'd love to explore. No. We still here. This is some l lady questions here. We haven't had enough ladies. <laughs> Us standing there clapping and kind of going at this um, 
It's fucked up. I mean, this, this chick is holding a gun to her head and we're cheering. And, and it's like, more, more. <laughs> it's like, I had to completely shatter everything. I was like, I just have to embarrass the shit on myself right now. Or I'd be okay with that. And, and the fact that it's like laughing and doing cake faces while this woman is contemplating suicide. And it's like, God, this is so fucked. But I'm like, well, I'm getting paid. And, <laughs> and, uh, I guess I can go there. You know, it's just a couple scenes, a couple takes. You know, it's going to be okay. <laughs> so that was, um, and then, then when we got off, like, a couple of the producers were like, dude, you have a great, insane face. I was like, I really appreciate that. I'll take that. I don't know how it felt for you, but I was, it was a turmoil for me. Uh, well, before I jump into that, I, I think it's a very important question because it's kind of a, it was a spontaneous opportunity. And um, this, uh, you know, I owe a lot of debt, gratitude to Sam Brooks because, uh, you know, I'm 54 years old. I'm playing a guy in his 30s. I auditioned for a character that was 25. And Anthony's the kind of generous director who Basically, I'm one year away from getting senior discounts. And he's like, yeah, we'll give you this job. And I'm like, that's pretty cool, right? So I'm already a little bit, you know, I'm at a little bit at that point where I'm just starting a new career. This is my retirement job. And if you pay a lot of money to be actors, uh, we have what? no, we have no, <laughs> we pay a lot of money to be actors. We get no, there is no movie without you. And so I'm like already thinking, oh gosh, I love entertaining people. Being on the set is like a holiday. They've got people taking care of us. We get spoiled. It's you know, um, it's a bit like, is this real type thing on all levels. So when we were asked to come forward and do this moment at the end of the film, Anthony said, "Hey, you know, let's do some ad living. You know, come on out and do something because we weren't originally written into that moment of the Malin film." And I, I'll be frank with you, like Anthony said. And then he emails says, hey, you know, if you got any questions or com comments or concerns, reach out to me. I'm like, uh, if you don't ask, you shall not receive. So I said, hey, can it possibly get more lines? Or maybe do some more stuff? And he's like, oh, well, we'll see what's up. And so he says, Sam, you know, you and, uh, he actually calls us, you know, Price and Hudson. Price and Hudson, you guys get over here and do some, do some stuff. And I'm like, because he just kept forgetting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so he says, <laughs> so he's like, you know, just do something. And it was very, it was a very uncomfortable moment for me because I am very rote and very precision, and I read the script many times, and I watched uh, Last Ship, and I'm a former businessman, and you know, everything is like study and you know, getting a grade in class type guy. And so the opportunity to add them required. Uh, getting over some nerves, like butterflies. So uh, on top of that, I had to figure out how to do that. So, you know, Sam was great. So he just grabs my arm, like, okay, let's just do this thing, and makes it feel breezy. So in the meantime, I'm sweating and panicking. I'm like, dude, just <laughs> do this with me, man, please. <laughs> so we played those scenes in real time, though, because I knew, like, for Jess, it's essentially a struggle session, which is, and also because she was facing away from the crowd. Those were very long takes that we did, allowing her to just get, she was just getting berated by the, by the cats for minutes at a time. They were just heckling her. And that's, I, my sound team, I'm sure they hated it because I, I never separated her audio from their audio. So we just recorded it live so that we could have her true, true performance reacting from just these people, a, a large group of people just parading and shouting at her for several minutes to get her to like those places. So you were in it for quite a long time. Well, yeah, that's true. And, and you know, this is something that's really rough. So Jessica's very much, you see an emotional person on screen. And I had the opportunity of dinner with her after the movie wrap. And um, I saw her reactions to that moment after it cut. And uh, it was rough, you know, she takes a lot for somebody in her position. I feel like I've got it easy, you know, it's cut, it's like I'm back to myself and she's struggling with, that was very emotional and you can see her really take a toll on her. And I mean, I don't know how you feel, but I feel like it obviously shows on the scene that Jessica Sula is really a fantastic actress. Here, here. 
Yes. So the question is, you know, about the, for those of you over here, the mold coming up the walls and that felt a bit like Silent Hill, getting the Silent Hill vibe. Is that coming from inspiration of Silent Hill? I think the first movie was, I, I, I haven't seen Silent Hill since I saw it when it came out of the theaters. But so I think like the first movie drew comparisons to Silent Hill as well. I think it's just, a, it's the nature of it being almost a first person shooter. Uh, you know, Last Ship was like that, Malum is like that, we are kind of just with this character on a almost game-like journey. Um, but not directly. I think, it, you know, style, and it's also, I worked with Clyde Barker for so many years, is in Silent Hill directly Clyde Barker's derivative? So it's that kind of like, where, where are we now? We're at Malum. But we just one step further down the line. Uh, ma'am. I was so drawn into the movie that I feel like when you walk away, the back of your head is going to be gone. <laughs> so, so the, 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 is that a question? <laughs> okay. So, for those of you who are videotaping us, despite the warning, and thank you for doing that, so I can get it from you later. Let's do the air drop on the back. I really want to get that footage. Um, did you have a question for us? Want to throw one out? I just wanted to say that. So, so if we're walking, walk, you know, she's a little concerned that if she walks away from us now, when you walk away. Yeah, you know, when we walk away, we're going to be like missing parts of our head. Um, I've been missing parts of my head for years, and you tried to sort that out in therapy. Uh, does somebody have a, another question? Yeah, yes, sir, I'm going to go with you, because I just saw you earlier. Oh, I was going to ask, uh, is, uh, John, the, the main John, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, he said he was the vessel for the demon, but then I noticed that he was on the throne, and then the demon came behind. So it seems uh, like a sub demon, it's a very complicated hierarchy, but I think you'll have to watch it a few times to fully understand. So the question was that John Allen is on the throne, is he a sub-demon, or you know, is he a vessel for the demon? And then he, like John explains it in the movie, he says it when he's talking to his congregation. You know, he is the low god is not this guy. You know, and so when you go back and watch it, this character is called the Temple Baron, and he's a harbinger for the Low God. We never see the Low God in this movie because the Low God enters John, and John becomes the King of Starless Nights. He, so he becomes something else. So maybe in the next movie you'll see the Low God for real. We're gonna have to but, a bit. but these things I felt like aren't like important enough to to hammer into it you know it's there and it's like i think most people coming out of the movie feel like this character is the logo or maybe the logo is a nickname for this character but it's in the it's in the text you know you can piece it out um and stick with that is so yeah, I wanted to piggyback off that mold uh, question. How much was at the beginning of the of the film the shift change? You mentioned careful with the black mold uh, causes hallucinations. How much was real and how much was hallucination? So this goes back to the mold. If you guys love mold so much, just you know, <laughs> so the question was you know, how much of this mold that we're seeing, how much of what's happening, what's being precipitated at that moment, is it a hallucination? How much is it real? I, I think you answered this earlier, saying that the mold is just a, a device. It's not really. Yeah, I don't think any of the movie was hallucination. I think every, I think she goes back to her father. You know, we saw her father kill people at the beginning of the movie. Now we did not see why he <coughs> killed those people. He saw why he killed those people. So I think now that we're in her point of view, we're seeing why he killed those people. Because she's killing people for the same reason, <coughs> so I don't. I think it's it's not so much the mold; it's just the yeah. it's the force in in the station and the attached to these people. I thought the force was. <laughs> <laughs> it is. 
I, I saw a hand up here. Yes, right there. Okay, here's the question. Was the hog a SAG member? Oh, no, was the hog easy to work with? It was the hog easy to work with. Uh, yes, strangely, enough, the hog was the easiest actor to work with. What? The hog was actually The, the big name was Yahtzee. So, Still alive. I'll tell it uh, uh, as quickly as I can story about the, the pig. So when we got there, we shot this movie in Kentucky. We knew we needed to find a a, a sow that was large enough and that fit the parameters right. So we went to uh, hog farms in Indiana. The problem is most of these hog farms are slaughter farms, right? So they're raising the pigs for slaughter. They all fit the bill how they look. They're just very skittish around people. They're not interacting with people. They don't develop relationships with people. They're just being fed and moved and raised that way. So the, the we met with this nice family that raised these hogs, and they were like, we're down to do it, and we'll bring two. We just don't know what is gonna happen. And I was like, man, it would be great if we could find a, a pet pig, someone who raised this pig. Strangely enough, we had already got this, this farm location in Kentucky. And like on our third visit, the daughter of the family said, she overheard us talking, and she's like, I have a pet pig, it's up on that hilltop. And, and she takes us up to the hill, and there's Yancey the pig. It, you know, but she raised that pig. It, it, it was inside the house for many years until it got too big. But it was like a 650, huge. And it's almost hard to tell how big it was. Like, yeah, so big, tall. It was so timid. But it acted like a pet. She would call it, and it would just come. It busted up. I mean, literally, it did that in one take. We did it three or four times, but it did it on the first try. It comes out. It, it, it was very friendly and it, it had no lines. <laughs> I, I also really didn't want to get a pig that I knew was going to go to slaughter. Because it's like everyone would get the cash to this pig. And then I, we would have had to make someone buy the pig. We, we would, there's no way we would have been like, okay, take back your pig so you can go kill it. Yahtzee, so and Yahtzee just had, it's a female, she just had a litter. And, she did, and the family's training the, the baby pigs to be movie pigs. Because <laughs> there were things that Yahtzee, her, even though she was very smart, she could not, getting a pig to lay down is near impossible on command. So now they're training their baby pigs to lay down to do these tricks that we need that Yahtzee to do. Preparing for the sequel, I think. <laughs> so do we have any questions over here? Okay, we'll go with you. First, I want to say thank you for last shit. It reminds me of a pawning pool, how you can do such great, huge ideas with small budgets, which is amazing. Pawning pool, too, yeah, great sound design. Uh, me and the wife were saw it when we did now in the fancy theaters. The first thing I was struck by is that it reminded me of 1977 The Sentinel. Oh, yeah. I love the Sentinel. You nailed such a scene that just mirrored it, <laughs> but elevated it so much because your cast is so strong. Well, thank you, thank you. Just sharing the love. There is great, sharing the love. Uh, the music in this movie is very, very atmospheric and really, really effective. I was just curious about, uh, did you get the composer like, direction on So this question is for Anthony. This is about Samuel, the composer of the film, and uh, you know, did he did he give direction or you know, did he let him fly? So uh, Samuel, uh, and, you know, thanks. For, I will say, if you enjoyed this movie, the one thing about you know trying watching it in a setting like this is the sound is a little, you know, we're not calibrated for a room, and, and we lost some of the score tracks. So if you like the movie, watch you get at home, you'll hear full score or get the record Samuel's score is is very powerful and in this room it's only coming out of the front speaker but we also the aspect ratio is different here right than what it looks like in theater yeah probably slightly a little squeeze but 
But Samuel, so I, he came on very early in the process um, before we started shooting the movie. So, and he he does the Outlast games. That's what he's most known for. Um, and so I didn't have, I don't, I don't, I didn't want to give him any direction. You know, I, I, I like a lot of the cast, he had not seen the first film. So I said, don't watch the first movie. I want you to just come at it fresh. And I gave him the script to read. And then while we were shooting, I would give him scenes. And that's how he would start composing and doing. He would, he would do these just journeys where he would do like 20 minute pieces of music and just say, here's an idea that he'd send it up to us. He did a lot of that. And we'd be like, oh, this part's really great. And through that process, we found kind of these things, these key things. And while I was editing the movie, I would take all these pieces and I would start to cut them in for a temp. So I never used temp score, I would only use his music. And then I, we would send him that and he would see kind of what I laid into the temp. And then he would start building the score off of it and, and layering it. And he got to spend a lot of time on it, which was good. But for music, every movie's different, but for this one, Sam's, to me, the hardest piece to nail was the last climax of the movie when it's just her and everyone screaming at her. I, I thought that would be the most challenging piece. And he, the, literally the first time he sent it to me, I said, it's perfect. I didn't have any notes on it. And after that was done, everything else kind of fell into place. Um, so he's, he had a huge hand in, in making this score what it is. But you heard very little of it in this screening. So get Waxwork Records is releasing it too. So if you like it, pick it up. Uh, just a quick plug, don't forget the contest. If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, go to Anthony's Instagram, you'll see a link there. Be sure to join if you're interested in filmmaking or if you just want swag, it's a wonderful contest. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, was, uh, my question was for uh, your characters, if they were uh, ghost cops, uh, were they gay ghost cops? Because you said that movie was pretty bad, so I you were joking. I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> first, first of all, um, the question is, you know, our characters, are we gay characters, are we ghost cops? <laughs> Hey, uh, ghost cops. Uh, 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 so this, this may be this. Yeah. So yeah. Would you like to say that's that? a different industry, though? You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you go first. It's easier to play. Well, there's a point where Andrew is like, you know, I thought about putting you guys in some suits and just having y'all fuck in the hallway. <laughs> I mean, I did. Say that was like the first day. Kind of like a shining moment. You know, like <laughs> <she's> <laughs> all my agents. Okay. But I, I think for the most part, I, mean, I think we're, again, we are just fucking with this chick who is there horrified, and we know this, and I'm just poking as many buttons as I can, and just to see when she will crack or not. And then also, when we were alive at the beginning of the film, that's just our banter, like uh, that's our lock in the banter. That's, you know, I, yeah. if you want us to be gay, Cops, gay ghost cops? Hell yeah, we're gay ghost cops. That's not true, that's not true at all. I can elaborate a little bit on this, because in, in, in Scott Boyle, my co-writer, you know, he's like a six-year-old boy when we're writing, and he's not, he actually doesn't watch a lot of horror films, so we have like this back and forth. And he, that was a line that he wrote, because he's like, ah, his six-year-old is laughing at this line. <laughs> and, like, and in the audition process, there were actors that refused to say that line. You know, like, it, but, but, no, he, he's like, he's good in bed. Like a lot, of, some of the actors were like, I heard he's good in bed, they would change it because they didn't quite understand it. In the scene though, the way it was shot, Sam says, just kidding, after the line. But I took that just kidding out in the end. <laughs> you don't remember. So I, because to me, the trick, the way he was, we shot that scene a few different ways where Sam is being very genuine to Jess, where he's like coming in almost more so in the first film. He's a, he's a genuine presence that's 
concerned about her father and concerned about her. And then we did it in this alternate way that I much preferred of him just fucking with her. And, and, and in the dry fucking with her version, that just kidding just didn't feel right. It felt better to just leave it hanging. And Pat would be like, I, I appreciate know. you leaving it hanging. Yeah, I don't know what's <laughs> happening with these two. So, uh, for, uh, you know, from my perspective, I'm a professional actor and by trade now, that's what I want to be doing. And, uh, you know, I have, I, I just come out from the material. I don't have a method acting process. So I don't have backstories. I don't dream up stuff. I don't do that. I come, I memorize the lines. I, I come. I come. I don't memorize the lines. I don't memorize the lines. I got seven pages of lines. He expanded that quite a bit. And I had seven pages of places where I spoke. Uh, but I don't come in character with a preconceived notion of what it is. I just, you know, I, I have an acting coach. We go through it. That's, you, know, you memorize the lines. You hit your mark. You deliver your lines. Can do your best, commit the rest, and you know whatever comes out of it is based on uh, absolute focus and attention towards you know your partner. That's the inspiration of my acting. That's how I do it. So whatever Sam was delivering at that moment, uh, I got from Bryce you know, that whatever that vibe was, and I delivered back whatever he was giving me at that moment. We had never worked together before. So I that's a, that's called pitch and catch. And <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> yes. How was it like on set when you guys did the decapitation scene? The question is, what was it like on set doing that amazing decapitation scene? So oh amazing. man, that was a pain in the ass, wasn't it, Damien? <laughs> we spent like a whole day on that scene. Was, you know, it, it's it's very difficult to have uh, a live actors doing hanging stunts and trying to, because because you can't leave her hanging more than like thirty seconds at a time. <laughs> so you have you do this, you redress, you send her for a stage of makeup, you send her away, she comes back, we shoot other things. It would it, the whole process was very tough. And then you know when you're doing heavy effects like that. Rarely do they work on the first go. You know, the blood works on the one go. The trash bag the, the, the trash bag for the blood worked gangbusters, but but the decapitation itself was a long, grueling process. That's not well, it's not fun to shoot, but we got there. We got one day. You did. It was a, it did. It took a long time. We got a question here. Uh, a couple actually. Uh, so. The Temple Baron is obviously the deity, but was it also a play on words because the temple is barren? So the Temple Baron is obviously a deity. The question is, is that a play on words? Is the Temple Baron? It wasn't, but I like that take. Yeah. So you know the, you have to pay her for this idea. The Temple Baron, <laughs> the, it, this is gonna sound like a, a, a hokey a horror director made up story, but I, the Temple Baron, I. The name the Temple Baron came to me in a dream several years ago. And I, I it was it wasn't the character or anything. It was a wo a voice in my set that said, We are the Temple Barons, listen to our plans. <laughs> so I woke up and I was like, what the fuck does that mean? I, I wrote it down and then I went back to sleep and then the next day I started Googling this like Temple Baron, what the hell? And it wasn't a thing. I just had that laying around for a few years, and then when we were doing this and creating these characters in mythology, I was like, I feel like this character is that Temple Baron. So it may all be all part of their plans, and this is actually you watching the movie is, is, is bringing this into reality, and maybe these things will be haunting your dreams, and this is all part of the Temple Baron's plan, it's all real. But it's not my fault. Don't blame it on me. <laughs> All the way there. Uh, you. Yes. Well, I've never seen the first one. Uh, was the actor in the first one? Uh, the question is, was uh, Jessica Sula in the first uh, movie, The Last Ship? The answer is no. It was Juliana Harkavy. Juliana Harkavy was in the first Who hasn't seen Last Ship in the room? See, I actually prefer that. Like, you know, it's, I, I think, you know, I. It is in the nature, and I think now the movie's out, 
double features and welcome and stuff like that. But our, we really made this for a new audience that didn't have to see last year. But it is the only returning cast member is my wife, Natalie, because I, you know, if I didn't put her in, she would have divorced me. <laughs> and she plays the same character. She plays Marigold, just in a different scene. Um, but everyone else is, is a new cast member. So there was a lady, uh, this is a totally a sidebar, and I had forgotten to ask this earlier, but there was a lady who came to the booth uh, twice, was hoping to get Anthony to sign the poster, waited a really long time, and then had, had to leave. And I wondered if you, are you here by any chance? She was, but she left about 10 minutes ago. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she waited as long as she could. Okay. No. Was she right? Right. I was just trying to help, you know. Oh. She was a plant. I planted her anyway. Plants her to make me feel good. <laughs> Okay, all the way back there is, is that, yes, you, yes. Uh, what was your uh, eight-year most excited to bring to life? Could you repeat that? Uh, Wait, you repeat it. Seeing he's most excited to bring to life. Okay, yes, the, the, the scene that he, I think he was most excited to bring to life. I mean, you know, going in, I think I'm always most excited about the monster stuff, and like the effects, and because that's what I really love about horror movies. But while I'm making the movie, I think often those scenes become very arduous and hard, right? They come together in in the in the because anytime you spill blood on a set, it's you don't realize how much of a nightmare the effects <laughs> every take moving forward. It becomes a very slow process. I think the scenes that I enjoy the most are the scenes with the actors. I think the, the the ending with Jess in that hallway was my most fulfilling of the shoot. And then you know, working with with like the scene with Britt and, and Jess and with Sam and, and CMS, those scenes really are I, I have a lot of fun playing with the cast and seeing what they'll come up with. I think that's I get a lot of fulfillment from directing by working with actors. Anthony is an actor's director, no question about it. He gave me the hardest direction I've ever had. Try to just learn a monologue, right? A little speech. And then try to say that while you're writing down your own phone number. <laughs> <laughs> and I was sorry. And I knew the line for her forever. And I was like, God, I can't do this. So I had to like, he goes, just write your real number down. Yeah, you know, it would be easier. I'm like, okay. Yeah, it's like, can you rub your stomach? Yeah. Back your head? That's what it was like. But it is one of those things, like, you want me to write down a number and speak at the same time. Yeah. It's like, it was tough. So we have a question in the front here. Okay, so going back to the last shift, this is a very rare uh, um, where it's the director and the writer both from the uh, first to the recast. Uh, what was your process on what you wanted to keep and what you wanted to do in the new? So the question is, you know, going from the last shift, being you know the person responsible for reimagining, you know, what did Anthony want to keep, and what did he want to make new, and what were the struggles there? I had to use the people around me as kind of a guiding light a lot of the time because I, while Scott and I were writing the treatment, because the Welcome Villain team, they were fans of the first movie, so for me as a director, I had to decipher well what are they fans of in the first movie. I want to be in Simpatico, but they're, what do they feel makes the first movie important to them? So very early on, I gave, we were giving them very rough treatments, which I think most people wouldn't do. But we like wrote a six page crappy treatment. I sent it to them, because I said, okay. There were things that I felt played really, like the cell scene in this movie, and I, I felt I wanted to do a version of that because it worked very well in the first movie. And a scene like Rip's scene, sites almost like inconsequential in a lot of ways when she first meets Rip in the hallway. But to me, I loved that scene in the first film. I wanted to have another version of that in this movie. So a lot of it was like, I, I went in going, I'm making this movie for a new audience. People who have seen Last Ship will see this movie and I want to give them a new experience, but I want the people who are seeing them fresh to get those tidbits from the first movie that I felt really worked. Um, and it's mainly in the first act. That's a lot of that stuff is in the first 35 minutes of the movie. And then it, and then it kind of 
and departs in other directions. But, but it really was a, a conversation with the producers and, and seeing from them, oh yeah, we really think we should all keep this in mind. A lot of it was, because I didn't want to get too focused on what I thought was important. It was more of a communal thing. Right here? Yeah, I'm just kind of curious. As artists, what is the reaction you were hoping to get from the audience for material like this? I mean, as a horror film fan, I'm here. Obviously. You can all hear that, right? <laughs> <laughs> he projects me here. For, I mean, you know, I want to do two things. And I made a lot of, I made several horror movies that I wouldn't categorize as horror movies. Like I don't think I don't think Dread is a horror movie. I don't think Extremity is a horror movie. Okay, I, I didn't make Dread or Extremity to scare people. I think Last Shift was my first horror movie, and my main and almost only goal in Last Shift was to scare people. Like if you were going like in a rickety fair haunted house ride and like the skeleton popping out, that was my main goal. And you could kind of like turn it off. This was that too. I wanted to scare people, first and foremost, but I also wanted to create an empathetic journey with the lead character where when we get to that ending, hopefully people are very affected by it. And, and that was really a big goal. Because I like I like horror movies that you can, you walk away from it and you're like, oh, that kind of like made me feel more emotion than I anticipated. Like, like I hope people can come away. Do we have any more break? Yes, move the baseball cap. All right, um, talking with y'all, I get the vibe that y'all are just as passionate about movies as us fans are. And I was wondering, um, what's the horror movie that made y'all fans? So the question was, you, first, the statement was, you got the impression that we're very passionate about horror films and these films that we're in. And, and the question is, what horror film you know, kind of catalyzed that or sparked that for us. And I really, did, did everybody want to take that? You go down the line. I was seven years old on vacation, and we we grew up in a modest house, and we didn't have HBO at the time, but the beach house did. And my parents were at the beach, and something was on. I didn't know what it was, and I was like, oh, there's a woman in the shower. <laughs> so I, 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 I stood stuck around. And uh, it was It. It was the movie It. And a uh, hellacious scene, and I couldn't close my eyes in the shower for, for about three years after that. And I couldn't have the, uh, like when the water was coming over my head, I would do this. And I'd stare at the drain, just to make sure. And my mom's an interior designer, so she'd always pull the curtain, like, you know, so that you wouldn't see the tub, you'd just see her nice, like, shower curtain thing. I would always pull that shit back and sure, I saw the shining shortly after that because I was like, I don't know what that thrill was I got from scaring the shit out of myself, but I kind of liked it. So then I saw the shining and that was worse. And then you know, I started to explore it more. And my friends got super into it, so probably it in that experience in a really roundabout way. Kind of nasty uh, For me, you know, I never thought I would ever be a horror film actor. Was serendipity happened, you know, sort of spontaneously because I feel like I clicked very well with the company. Plus, you know, I asked for the jobs, so and I feel like as an actor, you have to ask for the work. And Anthony responded positively to the request that I wanted to do the job. I thought the role was interesting. I thought the characters were interesting. I thought the script was well written, and that was reinforced after reading it a couple more times. The horror film that I always go to, my, my favorite horror film has always been Alien, and then my favorite action film has always been Aliens. <laughs> and, uh, like, you know, they're not, the Aliens is not a horror film in my opinion, but, but, it, but that's what really got me interested in 1979, I believe it was, and I was 10 years old, you know, in, in Aliens, Alien, and then I remember going to Hollywood, and I think it, it wasn't the, it wasn't the Chinese theater, it was the one across the street, I can never remember the name of it, but it was sort of like an Egyptian. They had the aliens with the Egyptian, and I saw Robert Townsend there, I remember seeing him there. He's not, you know, I've heard you. Yeah, I was shuffle. You don't see much of him now, but I, I saw him there. What about you, Greg? Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 I, 
I thought you said actors. Sorry, so did you say actors? <laughs> <laughs> anybody, <laughs> anybody. Okay, <laughs> you go first. Okay, uh, yeah. So I really like horror films. Um, he still does them. Yeah. My, my mother watched them growing up, and it just scared me. He you know? sounds like a psycho. I couldn't sleep. <laughs> it scared the crap out of me. Until, I was talking about earlier, I saw Fright Night. It was, it was double feature. We went to see Fright Night, uh, followed by Silver Rock. I wanted to see the cowboy. It's a weird double feature. <laughs> but it was a fright night. Just the jump scares in that, the sexiness of the movie, the coolness of the vampires, and just you know, everything about it I loved. And then Christine after that. So I took an appreciation for it, but I never really focused. I, I didn't care to be in horror films. I just every now and then I appreciated it. Then I saw a screen, the first 10 minutes of that movie, and then I started kind of taking a liking and seeking out movies. I thought it was a great date night. You know, or film, you know, and that one. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's why horror movies exist. Right? Yeah. It's to, so that dates could go out and cry. Yeah, I love a good jump scare in anything. So I appreciate that. I mean, when I was, my, I had parents that didn't care what I watched growing up. Like, they, my father loved horror movies and, you know, they rented them on Elm Street and I was too young to watch it. Then I, it's funny because you watch it and you're like, fucked up because I can't sleep because I'm like, <laughs> you know, seven. And then, and then by third grade, I'm obsessed with like Freddy Krueger, but you know, it's like, it's that graduation. I, I like ghost stories, like The Shining, which is cliche to say, but like The Shining is one of the only movies that really scared me. But the movies I watch over and over again, I don't, I don't watch horror movies like I make horror movies. And I don't know why that disconnect happens, but the ones that I watch over here are like Fright Night and Lost Boys and, yeah, and, Lost Boys. and The Blob and the remake and the thing. Like anything that's very effects -y, very effects driven of that era, I love to revisit over and over again. Uh, can we do a show of hands? Should we continue? So, how many people like to continue? Yeah, yeah, I, I just meant, yeah, how many more questions should we do? Up here, 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 there, 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 gotcha. there, okay. there, 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 So for those of you over here, uh, you know, it's rare to have a director go back and you know recreate scenes that he's done in the past. What was that like for you now that you have a little more budget to work with? When I was making this movie, I never revisited the first movie. So when I had written, when I wrote, when we started, right before we started writing the treatment, I watched Slash just once, just to say I did it again. And then after that, I never looked at it again. And I also never asked my cat, like Jess never, she'd never seen the movie. So I, I almost never thought about it. So I think anything that, when I was shooting it, it was just me like following what's on the page, just like I had for the first movie. So I, any similarities that are there are just either the subconscious working or because it was on the page in some way, again, like, never using the first script, only using the new script. So I think it was just not trying to recreate those scenes, is you just act like you're doing it for the first time, and then those instincts just kind of kick in again. That's, that's how I wanted to approach the movie. So I didn't feel like, because my biggest worry when they said, hey, do you want to make this movie? I was like, I don't know, do I want to make this movie? Like, am I gonna, find myself day three and be like, why the hell did I just do this? I never wanted to be in that position and luckily I never was. I never felt like, I never felt like, oh man, I, I, I feel like I already made this movie, which was good. But that was a gamble on my part. I didn't know. Okay gang, let's say uh, three more and then we're gonna go ahead and wrap because it's almost one o'clock, right? It's close. So uh, let's go here in the back. Sir, you've uh, 
lion colored cat. There you go. So, all right. I was trying to think of a question for Britt because I haven't heard enough from you in the panel. Like, every time you talk about screen, I was like amazing. Awesome. But I, here's my question. Well, you guys are amazing. Um, and I was thinking about it. He's playing basketball? At the, at the, I'm wondering. There's like kids being sacrificed in front of police stations, and your character is the only one at that police station. He was just like shooting hoops and losing it right before that happened. Is that, I, I mean, I'm trying to figure out why he's the first time you see him, he's got basketball, like throws it in the hallway, he screams about something, and then he's like turn around face the wall. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, mean, I bet you can't even answer this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know, it just for me to be able to do it in that moment, I come up with something, right? You know, who heard that the mold's not real, but I need to do something. I need to jump off point. So I chose that, you know, there's something going on. It's gotta be this fucking mold. I love it. And so that for me served as like a catalyst. And as remember how the ball kept popping up for her and seeing why yeah. I chose that it was popping up for me. How's that fucking ball here again? Yeah, so <laughs> and that, that is the answer, like because you see it then become a tormentor for her as well. Right. And, and and I felt like it was like Wilson just popping up all over the place. Remember Wilson from that? Yes, yes. Yes. So you know, I before I walked in I had that ball and I was in there and you could hear me. I like that you got the dialogue. <laughs> you can hear me just park ball. There's a PA standing next to me. He's looking at me like, oh, he's a local guy. He's like, what's wrong with him? He's like, this is a What's wrong with him? in there, he's beating on the ball. He's like, mad at it. Stop following me around. He's like, I'm a bitch. And, uh, you know, it just, you know, whatever happened from there. But I was just taking, it was a temper tantrum on that ball that was just haunting me. But have you ever, in, in life, have you ever done something like stub your toe on a car? You, you know, or the corner of a you know a table or something like that, and that's the worst thing in the world. You, you hit the table, you know, then that table did something wrong. And that's what that wall did to me. I love the answer, and I love that the demons are just fucking with people. Like an evil bed. That's amazing. They just take a ball, it's so petty, you put it somewhere. Right. Right. Hey, 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 here's something I didn't know until later, and he told me, but so the ball, yeah, you know. They don't have good hands, the ball's just kind of doing like all they want to do. And you know, I kicked that ball and I started rolling down the hallway. That wasn't planned and it stopped. And I didn't know this, but when I was walking towards her, and because that ball was there, I just gave it, you know, it was still haunted, it was tormented. So I kicked it into the room where the producers were. And I just <laughs> totally whizzed right by so I didn't know anybody was in the room. No, I, I don't know why he was standing in the room. And there was a monitor in there. He was just like, Ran into the closest room he could hide in when we were like clear the set. Who was it? Just it was Luke. Right. It was Luke. It was Luke. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was right by. <laughs> He's like hiding in the, in the middle of the yeah. set. Yeah. 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 After after watching Castaway, I switched from photos to UPS. Do um, <laughs> <laughs> you have a question in the back? In the black? Um, I was going to ask. Uh, well, let's go with her. Because she, I was pointing at her. But please. But you're um, next. It was very scary. I mean, it was a it was a scary location it because it, it's a police, it was a decommissioned police station. It was four stories in a basement. It was uh, it, there were inmates there for many, you know, many years of their lives. So like you just walk around, there was blood on the wall, like in the hallway, and, and you know it, it was very hot and, and it had a vibe. Those colors that you saw in the movie—that's what it felt like. It just if you were in there. It's also designed like a labyrinth because if there ever is a breakout, that the inmates would not be able to find their way out quickly. Mm -hmm. So, so it took me a very long time to ever get my bearings in that in that space. It was very, it was very labyrinth. Yeah. Uh, plus, the, you know that that chair with Mr. Hammond at the end there. Yeah, he he 
instructed the cross people to stick it right when we walk into the beginning of each other. Yeah. yeah. There it is. Like, just to get us in the right mood. It just creeped me out. The sound team, though, because I had what I did on the first movie and what I did on this movie, I had the sound team come out in pre production and record the station. So they spent two days recording just about every sound in that station and they, they brought any of that things out. And the scene where we shot the morgue sequence, that scene had crazy activity in it. That, that scene, that room really freaked the sound team out because they're like, it's making all these, there's no machinery down there that's making all these sounds that we hear in their breathing. That's why I, I will say I explored it quite heavily, that building, because I had hours of downtime on, <laughs> on some days. Nothing weird happened to me. I didn't feel any like cold pockets or anything. But it is it, there was a lot of mold. Uh, so <laughs> that was clean for the most part. Yeah. And then uh, you, I, I don't know. It, like like he said, you could definitely feel there's a mystery there. But as far as paranormal things definitely happening, I have nothing to witness. We have one more, and we're gonna wrap it up. Um, then we'll coming back to you. Yeah. Oh, when we were trying to figure out rock, paper, scissors? Yeah. I wanted to ask if you guys could do a rematch. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Rematch. 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 Absolutely. What's the prize, though? Yeah, what's the prize? A steam? Prize. Oh, shit. Right. <laughs> Two of three, or just one of them? Sudden death. Sudden death. Sudden death. Right. Sudden death. <laughs> Why am I We're doing the on shoot. It's very official rules. Left hand, face, right hand, five. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot! Oh. 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 Rock, paper, scissors, shoot! Thank you for watching now.